Hey, good evening, everyone. Marty Mazzara here. It's Friday, the 27th, 2023, coming at you for the second time today. Earlier today, we did a stock market technical analysis together. Tonight, we're going to look at our latest economic assessment via the scoring of our PWA index, and that's the graph you have in front of you here. Um, as you can see, we are moving in the right direction. We went from a negative 33 to a negative 29, and that was after bouncing off the bottom, going flat for a week, and then continuing to improve. We'll talk about some of the inputs tonight that are looking better, some that are looking the same. In fact, the better looking inputs have all of them went from negative to neutral. We have the same currently 16% of our inputs actually scoring positive. Now it's 44% scoring negative. It was 51 last week. 40% scoring neutral from 33 the previous week. So, um, you know, not hugely good, but obviously with a minus 29 score, but still a move in the right direction. We remain in the recession is very likely camp in 2023, albeit mild recession. And maybe some of this improvement here helps support that narrative. Now, as you look at the brief history of our index, it's now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be six years old this July, but we back tested it a, quite a few years, as I've shown you on a different graph. But, you know, it's not unusual you know, to get a lot of chop. In fact, when we were rolling over in 2019, as you can see, we were descending lower, but we did have periods, right, where things were beginning to look better. And so uh, we're having one of those currently. As for the inputs I wanted to share with you, I've got quite the lineup here this week. I want to start with retail sales. We had the number that everybody watches, the monthly retail sales number came out last week. But each week from Redbook, we get a weekly look that looks at year-over-year -year changes in the rate of sales, but it updates it every single week. And as you can see, the trend has been going in the wrong direction. It continues to with just a 4.6%, still an increase, but it's a deceleration in terms of the rate of increase. Personal consumption, we got the PCE data. We're going to look at the inflation-related information here in a minute. Uh, I talked about this on the earlier video. We did see negative 0.2%. So obviously that's not economically positive. Personal income rose 0.2%, uh, which was a little less than expected. We, the expectation was for 0.3%. Year over year basis, we're looking at 4.7%. Personal savings rate actually kicked up a little bit here this last month. That should be viewed on net as a positive. I've expressed my concern over the uh, you know, historically low savings rate. Clearly, people have been pulling from savings as they've been wrapping up credit cards uh, to, to fund their spending. And again, you could argue, as many economists do, that that's actually bullish for the economy because it shows a willingness to spend. And if the economy doesn't roll into a deep recession, well, that's just a good sign. And for now, of course, that spending helps keep the economy on track. I might take the other side of that or, or argue the other side of that. And that is that if the economy is weakening, if, if people are ramping up credit card spending and pulling from savings, uh, there's a chance that that may be just to actually make ends meet on a month to month basis, which is a reflection of a relatively poor or a weakening economy. And I think there's some of that going on here as well. Mortgage purchase applications. Um, you know, I said last week that maybe it was coming off of the holidays and then we got this big ramp up, but we got another one. This, this, is, uh, this, is one of, this is one of those indicators that went from negative to neutral because we've had two really good solid weeks. Of course, mortgage rates have come down a little bit, but you know, they're still high relative to what most people are used to the past few decades. And so, uh, again, that right there, I have to say, is an unambiguous positive sign. Consumer confidence, the, we got the final reading of the University of Michigan's survey came out today, in fact. And I'm going to 
leverage uh, the good old economist Peter Bookvar and because he does a good job of parsing some of this data. And I'll just read from his note today. The final January University of Michigan consumer confidence figure was 64.9 versus the first print of 64.6, and it compares with the 59.7 in December, highest figure since April of 2022 but still remains below the 101 seen in February of 2020. Most of the month-on-month -month gain was driven by the rise in current conditions. One-year inflation expectations fell to 3.9% from 4.4 versus 4 in the initial January print. The 5 to 10-year outlook was unchanged at 2.9%, um, but that was at 3% in the preliminary January survey. Bottom line from the University of Michigan was that the gain in confidence resulted from improving assessments of both personal finances and buying conditions for durables supported by strong incomes and easing price pressures. Here, though, is the caveat. There are considerable downside risks to sentiment, with two-thirds of consumers expecting an economic downturn during the next year. Also of note, while the recent easing of inflation has been noted, and welcome, welcome by consumers, and again, this comes straight from the report. Its positive effects on sentiment were partially offset by the negative impact of rising borrowing costs. For the third consecutive month, at least 30% of consumers spontaneously cited high interest rates as a reason for poor buying conditions for durables, cars, and homes. So, yeah, definitely positive. Mixed message in there. There's enough negative in there to be concerned about and not uh, necessarily back up the truck when it comes to risk on assets. But um, again, we'll take it. Weekly jobless claims continue to defy our logic that the economy is weakening right at 186. That is just historically low. Although we did get a little bit of a tick up in continuing claims. So now this is the area that the Fed has probably talked about the most and that is the labor market. So. It remains tight, and if you take the Fed at their word of late, then they remain tight as we go into next week's policy meeting, although it looks like it's going to be a quarter point increase. If it's a hawkish quarter point, what that means is if they say, yes, we're slowing down the pace, but we're keeping rates higher for longer, and we probably have another rate increase. If they imply that, uh, for March, um, and if they do it tough enough, then I think the market's got some problems coming out of next week's meeting. If it sounds dovish, if it's kind of like the Bank of Canada did here this last week and basically rose a quarter point and said, we're going to pause for a while, I think the market would absolutely love that. So uh, we shall see. Um, all indications are that they're going to try their best not to give financial markets any more of a green light right here because it that is akin to loosening financial conditions and that's pretty much what we have when the fed is vowed to keep financial conditions relatively tight going forward durable goods orders at the headline level actually saw quite the increase 5.6 percent month on month versus 2.8 percent was the consensus expectation up 11 percent year over year However, when we do what we need to do, and that is X out transportation orders, we actually declined by 10 basis points month on month, and core durable goods were down uh, 20 basis points. And so um, while the headline is impressive, when we dig down below the surface to what we think counts, uh, no, nah, durable goods was not all that encouraging for December. Leading economic indicators came out on Monday. I showed this as I think it was a chart of the day, or maybe it was one of the morning notes this week. Uh, this is our leading economic indicator to coincident economic indicators ratio. And remember, leading indicators are things like average hours worked in manufacturing, jobless claims, new orders, ISM manufacturing orders, capital goods, new orders, building permits, the stock market, and so on. Coincident indicators are non-farm payrolls, personal income, less transfer payments, industrial production, manufacturing sales, and so forth. So obviously when the relationship to leading to coincidence is rolling over, meaning when this rolls over, leading indicators are underperforming coincident indicators. To this extent, 
this extreme, this kind of trend has always been a precursor to recession. In fact, I've seen a number of economists say that we've never had this kind of action in leading economic indicators without it turning into recession. To give you just another kind of optic here, the green is the leading economic indicators. The purple is the coincident economic indicators. And you can see there's a lot of noise there. There are periods here where we dip below, but typically when we dip below to this degree, it, it's coincident with recession or just previous to recession. So here we have the, um, the early 00s recession. Here we have the big one, 2008. You can see what was going on here. So pretty convincing here uh, with regard to those of us who think recession is on the near-term horizon. The Chicago Fed National Activity Index, I think improved just a titch. You can call it flat. 85 data points there. 45 were negative. 40 were positive for that index. Still negative, uh, which denotes you know contraction in the economy. The um, U.S. Economic Surprise Index got close to zero. Went from down 17 to, to just a minus three. Remember, this is just how the data is coming out relative to what economists had predicted or estimated it would be. Okay, so now we get into the inflation. This is the PCE deflators data. So headline rose by 5.02. So the rate of change continues to roll over. Core, which X's out food and energy at 4.4, 0.05 on a month over month basis. So as you can see, folks, and as we talked about way back here, you know, inflation, of course, is rolling over as it would if indeed the economy is weakening. And of course, we have not nearly the bottlenecks in the supply chain and so forth. But, you know, historically, we're still sitting at, uh, you know, high levels of, uh, of inflation. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Historically high. And the Fed says they want to achieve their 2% target. So they've said that, you know, we're not giving up till we get there. Well, probably take recession to get there at all sustainably or below. That's what indeed happens during recessions, right? Here's the last two, right? And you can see inflation dropping down, you know, below their target. That'll happen again if indeed... We get a recession, which we think is likely given the data, and in particular, if the Fed continues to implement what would be considered tight monetary policy. Okay, commodities, the Bloomberg Commodity Index. Let me zoom out a little more on this one. Commodity bull and bear markets tend to be multi-year affairs, and we think this is the beginning of a multi-year affair with, uh, with commodities in a bull market kind of way. It could struggle here for a while, particularly if we're right on our recession thesis. But when you factor in, you know, China reopening um, and then that, that real important structural stuff that we've talked about, populism, I want to say deglobalization. Some people say multipolarity. We used to be unipolar with the U.S. really ruling everything. But at the end of the day, the trend and the sentiment and the politics is one of gradual deglobalization, which is ultimately an inflationary phenomenon, if indeed it continues. But, you know, there's lots and we've spent, you know, we've spent volumes over the last couple of years kind of talking about why we're in that secular inflation camp. So, of course, there'll be much more of that to come as we go forward. The um, raw industrial materials, these aren't materials that are priced in the futures pit. So it maybe gives you a truer look. So you see that beginning to come back, of course, and that would be inflationary potentially going forward. Copper, remember I, I said last week that we're looking at something in terms of just the trend of being unsustainable. And again, we're very bullish copper longer term. Um, I, as I said last week, this is going to flat either, you know, really flatten out and slope in a more normal way. Give some back would not surprise me if we gave some back, particularly in a recessionary scenario. But clearly the world is undersupplied. Copper inventories are down, way down relative to demand. So on a trend, secular basis, if you will, uh, it's going to be upward pressure on copper. I think that's I think there's very little doubt about that. But lots of choppiness. Um, traders can trade that down in a hurry. If we come back from the Chinese New Year 
and we have just, you know, oodles of COVID cases and people can't go to work and so forth because they just opened up and, and ripped the masks off, so to speak. Um, you know, that could do a number on, on um, prospects for, you know, copper for a while. But uh, we definitely want to be positioned there longer term. And then I got to tell you, judging by the look of our 30-day sector analysis, these are various sector ratios to the S&P 500. Above 100 means outperforming the S&P. It's a look at what the market implies relative to the economy. Tech of late has been notably outperformed the S&P. Financials slightly outperformed the S&P. Consumer discretionary hugely outperforming the S&P. Materials outperforming, energy slightly underperforming, industrial slightly underperforming. Okay, so four out of the six sensitive sectors, if you will, uh, are outperforming the S and P. While the defensive sectors, the you know consumer staples, utilities, and healthcare are dramatically underperforming the S and P 500. So, from a market signal standpoint, recession over relative to how these sectors are acting. Of course, that's not our base case, but we do think um, investors clearly are interpreting the weakening economic data into a scenario that would have the Fed softening up and literally creating a soft landing, no recession type scenario. We think the market is maybe off sides here, which means it could be painful if, if we're right. But um, again, we got to score it as we see it. And that's, that's an unambiguous positive for our PWA index. And then last but not least, um, really just drilling down on that same idea is our XLP, which is the Staples ETF to XLY, which is discretionary ETF. Uh, we've seen that Staples just dramatically outperform discretionary coming into this year. Well, that's rolled over completely to the tune of a 14% differential. So consumer discretionary is dramatically outperforming consumer staples so far this year, which again flies directly in the face of our overall recession thesis. So folks, there you have it, a, an improving picture. We are still living within a setup by our assessment that says recession likely during the course of 2023. As I said in an earlier video, and I've said multiple times here of late, we don't think equity prices are reflecting the earnings hit that these kinds of conditions ultimately bring. With that in mind, let me go back to my leading economic indicator, coincident indicator ratio. Readers of the blog recall that I included this orange line. And this is uh, S&P 500 aggregated earnings. So um, as you can see, as our indicator here rolls over historically, so do corporate earnings, right? So do corporate earnings. Um, here we've rolled over aggressively and corporate earnings continue to hold up. So that's the narrative we've been presenting you. And that is if indeed this means recession as it always has historically this kind of descent well then corporate earnings will ultimately roll over to reflect that when that happens you know what that means right for stock prices particularly if the fed is still concerned about inflation and they're not ready to rescue the market and i don't think they are at these levels could be wrong because the data is softening to the point where they could indeed justify a pause They've said they don't want to do that. They don't want an early 80s scenario where Volcker got aggressive, economy rolled over, paused, and then, and then inflation shot right back up. They referenced that multiple times. It happened in the 70s as well. They said they really want to avoid that this time. So if they mean it, then um, we're going to get a hawkish 25 basis points next week. Um, if the economy is beginning to worry them to the to a greater degree than they've let on of late, well, then it'll be a dovish 25 basis point increase. And then we may have to start having a different discussion about our outlook for equities. But right now, even without the Fed um, changing much or even softening a bit, you know, historically, the market continues to fall once they start cutting because the stage has been set for dramatically declining corporate earnings. 
Uh, many of these layoffs that we're seeing across the tech sector and now other sectors as well, it's clearly CEOs trying to get in front of that by cutting, cutting costs because they anticipate that this line will roll over during the course of 2023. All of it uh, remains to be seen. Time will tell, if you will. Thank you, folks, as always, for watching and listening. Have a wonderful weekend. Send you a note Monday morning. Take care. Bye-bye.